Papa. Please. Please be strong. Please. Wake up. <laughs> Mommy is gone. We... We can't lose you too. <laughs> Please. Abang, beras dah tak cukup dah. Hanya boleh tahan sampai ujung minggu ni. Hmm, sewa rumah pun dah hutang tiga bulan. Kalau tak mampu bayar, nanti kena halau. Hmm, siapa yang boleh tolong kita, Abang? Mami, when can I go back to school? I really miss my friends leh. Hey,我跟你说,今天的ABC华人真的危险啊 Hey, how many times must I tell you? Covid out there so dangerous. Still want to go out. Hey, cannot stay at home, eh? See, the ambulance is here again. Five times they did this week. Go la, go la. Next round, ah, sure I will turn one. Life is hard. I couldn't get a job with a master cert. I really tried, but I just got nothing. I don't know what to do. When will this pandemic end? It has been almost two years since the start of the COVID-19 outbreak. This pandemic has left many people trapped in what looks like a tunnel with no light at the end. Many people have begun to feel despair, feeling that their lives have come to an abrupt stop, losing their direction and unable to envision the future. What lies ahead for our future? And when will we see the light at the end of the tunnel? Assembly organized by Sokagakai Malaysia Youth Division. We are the hosts for today. I'm Kelvin. And I'm Jane. As the pandemic continues, many have lost their passion and hope in life, being slowly swallowed by a sense of powerlessness. So, how can we break through this current situation rising? from adversity and create values in our lives? Well, this is the objective of today's Nationwide Youth Peace Assembly. The theme for the Nationwide Youth Peace Assembly this year is We Arise with the Light of Hope. Let us bring forth the passion and power of youth to spread hope and positive messages to our society shading the light of hope on people who are struggling amid this pandemic. Yes, you're right! In the 2021 Peace Proposal title, Value Creation in a Time of Crisis, Sokagakai International President Dr. Daisaku Ikeda expressed high hopes for young people to actively put forward new ideas to solve global challenges, exchange views with one another, and together 
build a society and a world in which everyone can live in peace. Wow! I can't wait to join this Youth Peace Assembly. But first, let's take a look at the social and global issues caused by this pandemic. To date, the novel coronavirus has infected more than 2 billion people worldwide. As of September 3rd, Malaysia had more than 1.8 million confirmed COVID cases and a total of 17,521 deaths. These are not just abstract numbers in statistics. These are about people, about human lives. These numbers represent someone's mother, father, grandparents, children, and friends. A famous Japanese director, Takeshi Kitano, once said, This is not one incident in which 20,000 people died. It is 20,000 incidents in each of which one person died. What makes us even sadder is that so many people could not spend their final moments in life saying their final goodbyes to their loved ones during this pandemic. Those who are left behind by the disease are filled with sadness, loneliness, and regret. This pandemic has not only impacted our lives and taken away our loved ones, but also caused various negative impacts on society. Here, we would like to talk about three impacts of this pandemic. Let's take a look. Point number one, infodemic. During this pandemic, we saw the emergence of the phenomenon known as infodemic. This new term infodemic is used to refer to the spread of misinformation or incitement that can intensify discrimination and prejudice thus eroding the very foundations of human society. This is in fact another kind of pandemic. As what we heard in the beginning regarding the spread of news about the ABC market, I believe, well, many of us have seen this in our daily messages and out of kindness, we want to share these with our friends and family. But please be mindful that we might be manipulated by those with bad intentions falling into their traps by helping them to spread misinformation that can intensify fear and anxiety in our society. President Nikeda said, The dangers arising from failure to thoroughly expose errors by challenging falsehoods and misinformation are not limited to the resulting dearth of correct information and knowledge. Of even graver concern is the existing discrimination and prejudice behind the rumours that deepen the fractures within society. Therefore, while looking at the worsening situation of the pandemic day after day, it coupled with those fear-triggering messages that we receive in our WhatsApp, people are starting to lose hope. Without hope, how can one pull through the present and look forward to the future? Point number two, human rights issue. The implemented lockdown due to the pandemic has resulted in people staying at home for a long period of time. For some families, this may be a great time to strengthen relationships with family members. However, it can be the opposite for some other families with various challenges. According to BBC News, the COVID-19 has not only exposed us to the risk of the virus, but also put women at an increased risk of domestic abuse. The United Nations has also reported that the implemented lockdown as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak could lead to a 20% increase in domestic violence and potentially causing 15 million more domestic violence cases for every three months of lockdown. During the MCO from March till August 2020, there were nearly 2,000 domestic violence cases in Malaysia which was a whopping 53% increase compared to pre-pandemic times. More than 80% of the victims are females. Furthermore, during MCO 2.0 from January till March this year, there was also an increase in child sexual abuse cases, where 35% of the assaulters were family members. All these happen mainly due to the increased stress levels of being confined at home, leaving the abusers with fewer outlets to release their stress, 
At the same time, the victims are unable to reach out for help. Mm, that's right. However, besides women and children, migrant workers are also facing human rights issues. Also known as foreign laborers, people tend to look down and have stereotypes against them, thinking that they are unhygienic, therefore leading to the infected dormitory clusters. But is this really the case? The Department of Labor of Peninsula Malaysia has inspected many employees' dormitories and found that the accommodations provided by employers are in extremely terrible and dirty conditions that do not comply with the Malaysian labor law. Look at these pictures. The dormitory rooms are cramped and shabby. Even the ceilings are about to collapse. The mattresses and pillows are very dirty. Furthermore, there are no kitchens and emergency exits, resulting in potential safety hazard. Let's think about the occurrence of foreign worker clusters again. Is it caused by their poor hygiene practices? Or is it because their basic rights are not taken care of by the employers at the very first place? Point number three, economic downturn. According to the Annual Employment Outlook Report published by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, also known as OECD, approximately 114 million people have lost their jobs during this pandemic, throwing many families into financial difficulties. Next, the Department of Statistics Malaysia states 70% of workers do not have enough savings to live on for a month and at least 8% of the M40 income group have fallen into the B40 income group. Many of the small and medium-sized enterprises and businesses have declared bankruptcy. This has clearly shown that the pandemic has severely impacted the financial situation of countless people. The lockdown measures implemented by the government are to contain the spread of the pandemic. But on the other hand, it has led to a severe economic recession. Hence, the issue of maintaining the economy or controlling the pandemic has become a dilemma. That is very true. In fact, the impact from these social issues can affect every one of us and our families. In order to solve these problems, we need to think and analyze the issues from the social perspective and look for the most appropriate countermeasures. Yes, from the above sharing, we can truly feel the serious impact of this pandemic on our society and country. Nonetheless, it is precisely in such times of crisis that we need to stand in solidarity with great perseverance to overcome the problems. So, how shall we build solidarity in the fight against COVID-19? Now, let's listen to the sharing by two young speakers. As mentioned earlier, our world today is facing a complex set of urgent crises that is so unprecedented in the history of humankind. This may be the greatest crisis with the greatest impact in reference to just a single disaster in human history. The onslaught of the pandemic has raised the economic and human rights issues and even threatened the right of survival and dignity of all humankind. In the 2021 peace proposal, President Ikeda writes, if you were to compare the nations of the world to ships that are each engaged in an ocean passage, the novel coronavirus represent a storm of unmatched fury that has struck them all at the same time, such that despite being in the same sea of troubles, the all rigs been blown up caused in different and random directions. Hence, it is of the utmost importance that countries rise above their differences and immediate interests to unite in this crisis and strive to reduce and eliminate the threats faced by humanity. But the question is, how can we achieve this? The renowned 20th century British historian, Dr. Arnold J. Toynbee, 
left us these words. All experience in the past gives us the only light on the future that is accessible to us. Let us now look back in history and see how humanity has responded to the crisis of pandemics in solidarity. This great example took place in the 1950s, where experts from the United States and the Soviet Union collaborated to develop a vaccine against polio in the midst of escalating Cold War tensions. Polio is a highly infectious disease caused by the polio virus. It invades the nervous system and can cause total paralysis in just a matter of hours, resulting in permanent disability or death. Infants and children are among the most vulnerable groups to this disease. The polio outbreak at that time infected thousands of children. In order to prevent the spread of polio infection, efforts were made by the United States to develop an orally administered vaccine. However, as most of the Americans had been vaccinated, it was relatively difficult to conduct clinical trials for this new vaccine. On the other hand, despite the possible benefits for its own children, the Soviet Union was at first cold to the idea of collaboration with its rival, the United States. However, concerned about the increasing rates of infection over time, the Soviet authorities sought ways to work with the US. On a mutual consensus, both countries started supporting large-scale trials in the Soviet Union and its neighbours from 1959, leading to the development of a safe and effective live virus vaccine. This, in fact, helped other countries prevent the spread of the polio virus too. Wow! This kind of people-centered international cooperation is exactly what we need right now. If countries can put aside differences and ideologies and come together to fight against this pandemic, we can surely find a way out from this crisis. That's right. In the 2021 peace proposal, President Ikeda also emphasizes the need to strengthen international cooperation. He believes that the international community should make the present crisis an opportunity for strengthening people-centered multilateralism through the UN system. In other words, cooperation among the international community must always be based on the benefits and well-being of all humankind. In this spirit, some international organizations such as the World Food Programme and United Nations Children's Fund have also been providing food assistance and logistical support to deliver urgently needed medical supplies and humanitarian relief during this pandemic. This also ensures that those who would otherwise be left behind are able to get immediate assistance, paving the way for international cooperation. One key focus of the international cooperation is to ensure that all countries have a stable supply of vaccines to stop the spread of the pandemic. Hmm, but the development and procurement of vaccines are usually dominated by the advanced countries. How can we ensure prompt and equitable access to vaccines for all countries, especially for those developing or low-income countries? Good question. To address this issue, in April last year, one month after the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, the World Health Organization, along with governmental and civil society partners, launched the COVID-19 Global Vaccine Access Facility, or in short, COVAX, to ensure rapid and equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines across the globe. Currently, a total of 190 states and territories are participating in the COVAX facility which aims to deliver 2 billion doses of vaccine worldwide by the end of 2021, among which 1.3 billion doses will be provided to 92 low-income countries. In fact, the COVAX facility has also benefited Malaysia. By sending on to the COVAX facility in November last year, we have secured the supply of vaccines for 10% of Malaysia's population. This includes the first batch of AstraZeneca vaccines, which was received on April 21st this year. Oh yes, 
My family and I were also vaccinated with AstraZeneca vaccines in May, thanks to the COVAX facility. We are able to get our vaccinations as soon as possible to protect ourselves and others. Yes, this also echoes the slogan put forward by the WHO since the outbreak that says, no one is safe until everyone is saved. Just as the word pandemic has its roots in the Greek pandemos, meaning all people, the most important thing now is that each and every one of us should shoulder a shared responsibility to fight against this pandemic. So, what can we do? First of all, we must return to the most basic preventive measures and practice good personal hygiene habits, such as wearing masks correctly and washing our hands frequently. In addition, avoid going out if it is not necessary. If feeling unwell, you should consciously avoid participating in social activities. And most importantly, get vaccinated as soon as possible to fulfill all civic responsibilities. That's right. It's everyone's responsibility to fight against the pandemic, even though we are in the midst of a severe crisis. But as long as we continue to create and maintain a shared awareness of the need to work in solidarity and to expand the number of people taking responsibility to build resilience in their respective societies, we will surely break through the impasses and overcome the storm of crisis. Thank you to our two youth for the wonderful sharing. After listening to their sharing, I have an even stronger conviction that as long as humanity continues to expand our network of solidarity and does not leave behind any individual or country, we can definitely construct an era in which everyone can live with dignity. This is the only form of security that will bring about authentic peace. Yes, this reminds me of the great news we ushered in on January 22nd this year. The long-awaited treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, TPNW, has entered into force. This is also a significant milestone created through global solidarity, marking the beginning of the end of the nuclear age. Last October, on hearing that the TPNW had met the condition to enter into force, as a Hiba Kusha who has dedicated her life to realizing a world without nuclear weapons, Setsuko Turlo shared the following words. When I learned that we reached our 50th ratification, I was not able to stand. I remained in my chair and put my head in my hands and I cried tears of joy. I have a tremendous sense of accomplishment and fulfillment, a sense of satisfaction and gratitude. I know other survivors share these emotions, whether we are survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki or test survivors. What a moving scene! I believe there must be an unwavering conviction coupled with the sweat and tears of unremitting struggles behind such great achievement. Now, let us walk through the time tunnel and take a look at how civil society united to create this momentous milestone on the journey to a world free from nuclear weapons. On August 6th and August 9th, 1945, the United States shocked the world by dropping two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, killing hundreds of thousands of people instantly. Thereafter, the two cities continued to suffer from the terrible consequences of atomic bombings, including physical and psychological trauma. One of the atomic bomb survivors, Emiko Yamanaka, recalled the painful experience that happened when she was only 11 years old in her memoir of the atomic bombing. At the time, she was on her way to the doctors. Suddenly, she was bathed in a flash, smashed against the ground, and lost consciousness. When she woke up, she found herself buried under the rubble 
and started to cry for help. A man came over to remove the rubble and extended his arm to her. When Emiko grabbed the man's hand, the skin slipped right off. Nevertheless, he did his best to pull her out from the rubble. The scene that appeared before her eyes after being rescued was one she would never forget. The vibrant morning turned as dark as nightfall, and people were fleeing around in the darkness with their tousled hair. Half naked bodies were burned to pieces. Although Emiko survived the atomic bombing, she experienced infinite pain and suffering later on in life. In addition to the different discriminations she faced, she continuously suffered from various diseases and cancers as a result of exposure to radiation. What pained her more was to see her three daughters suffer, one after another, from genetic diseases caused by the radiation. Each time her children fell ill, she continuously cried out in her heart, Please forgive me. Her only wish was for her daughters to overcome the illness and attain happiness. Emiko's story is one of the many stories among survivors of the atomic bombing. It's precisely because these survivors experienced the agony and misery brought on by the nuclear weapon that they vowed to never allow anyone else to suffer the pain they had endured. For more than seven decades, they have been campaigning for nuclear abolition, working together with NGOs, civil society organizations, and governments to carry out international collaborations and generate buzz against nuclear weapons across the globe, creating a driving force for the total elimination of nuclear weapons. Among them, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, also known as ICANN, plays an important coordinating role in pushing for a ban on nuclear weapons. Since the establishment of ICANN in 2007, it has collaborated with governments and NGOs from more than 100 countries and was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. As ICANN's international partner, the Soka Gakai International also works on raising awareness on the dangers of nuclear weapons and promoting nuclear abolition through various activities, including promoting anti-nuclear exhibitions and collecting atomic bomb survivors' experiences. And since 2007, Soka Gakai Malaysia has also been actively promoting anti-nuclear exhibitions holding peace talks and peace runs in all states across the nation. In 2020, the Rakan TPNW social media platform was launched to further contribute to the promotion of peace and disarmament education. Yes, after more than 75 years of tireless efforts by governments, civil society organizations and peace activists around the world, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons finally enter into force on January 22, 2021. The TPNW is an international treaty that prohibits state parties to develop, test, produce, stockpile, use, or threaten to use nuclear weapons. The entry into force of the TPNW is undoubtedly a turning point in human history, marking the beginning of a new era for humanity. And why do I say so? First, the TPNW is the first legally binding instrument in human history to prohibit nuclear weapons. Second, the TPNW is the first treaty to include the provisions to help address the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapon use and testing. Third, the entry into force of the TPNW is the crystallization of the concerted efforts of civil society and states to abolish nuclear weapons. Following the entry into force of the momentous TPNW, 
Our next challenge is how we can unite to end the era of nuclear weapons. What can we do as ordinary citizens to abolish nuclear weapons? First, we can learn about the threats of nuclear weapons and the importance of abolishing them, as well as share and talk with our friends to enhance public awareness on this issue. We can also hold or support events and programs that advocate the elimination of such destructive weapons or write about these issues. In his historic declaration calling for the abolition of nuclear weapons made in 1957, Second Sukagakai President Jose Tuna urged everyone to rip out the claws hidden in the very depths of such weapons. These claws are namely the violent thoughts that jeopardize the dignity of others' lives. Thus, we must always deeply reflect and better ourselves while doing our best to build trust and respect through dialogues to break the barriers among people. Let's work together to fight against the culture of violence and create a peaceful century in build respect for the dignity of all human lives. Thank you to the two years for their sharing that allowed us to have a deeper understanding of the significance of the TPNW and our way forward to abolish nuclear weapons. The entry into force of the TPNW has revealed to the world that despite the critical situation of the pandemic, as long as people continue to strive together towards the same goal, we can definitely create a new history that will illuminate humanity with the light of hope. Yes, though we are currently facing a harsh winter of the pandemic, we must uphold the same conviction while looking forward to building a wonderful springtime of a post-COVID world. Hmm, having said that, have you ever thought about how the post-COVID world will be like? Or what kind of life we hope to live after the pandemic? Now, let us close our eyes and imagine. Imagine the day when we can remove our masks and take a deep breath of fresh air. The day when the community regains its vitality, when we can embrace our families, dine with our friends and relatives, talking and laughing together to our heart's content. Saya harap saya boleh bawa keluarga saya bercuti Beralik kampung macam biasa Jumpa kawan-kawan lepas Covid ni Tak ada So I hope that we can travel again And uh, and hope that um, our kids can go back to school I uh, actually don't like this um, ritual online classes Hope they can you know go to school and have a face-to-face -face classes with their teachers Tensi Sambi Ya si wang kata jingji hui mama no Saya nak menjalani kehidupan tanpa rasa takut dan berharap dah tak perlu pakai mask supaya dapat tengok senyuman dekat orang sekeliling. Saya harap dalam masa depan, di 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 masa depan, Wow, what a wonderful vision! Through the interviews of Earth, we can better understand the aspirations of people from all walks of life for the post-pandemic era. So, how should we build a better society in a post-COVID world? Next, let us invite three youth to explore with us on how to rebuild our life in the world after the pandemic. As mentioned earlier, the magnitude of the COVID-19 outbreak on human society has far exceeded crises in the past, causing 1.6 billion workers to lose their jobs. These 1.6 billion workers are equivalent to nearly half of the global workforce, of which the capacity to earn a living has been severely impaired and are now struggling in the depths of adversity. Therefore, 
In his peace proposal, President Ikeda mentioned that in the face of this pandemic, there's an urgent need to strengthen the access to social protection systems. We provide a lifetime of social assistance to individuals facing financial challenges due to the loss of work and ill health and to support the foundations of people's lives. Since the COVID-19 outbreak, some governments have taken measures to provide loans, tax reductions and cash transfers to stimulate the economy, protect the survival of businesses and secure job opportunities. However, the unprecedented scale of the crisis means that this is not only a short-term challenge, it might require sustained policy efforts over the coming months and possibly years. For this reason, President Ikeda suggested that one direction this could take is the development of new industries and the creation of job opportunities through rapid transition into a green economy and thus strengthening the social protection systems. Here, I would like to share with you a successful example, the Great Green Wall. In short, GGW, which is an initiative launched by the African Union, launched in 2007. The Great Green Wall GGW project has developed a vegetation belt over a length of some 8,000 kilometers across the region of the Sahara Desert. To this day, this initiative has succeeded in restoring 20 million hectares of degraded land. Some key results of this movement include the creation of 335,000 green jobs in such areas as tree planting and agriculture, mitigation of persistent food insecurity due to desertification, stabilization of health and living conditions, as well as advancing economic development initiatives in the region. Isn't that an inspiring accomplishment? The example above has not only improved the environment, but also protects the basic living needs of many African people, allowing them to enjoy their human rights. Speaking of human rights, we must also strive to construct a culture of human rights in the post-COVID world. Although the issues of human rights have long existed, the pandemic has worsened the problem of human rights violations. For example, the infodemic caused by the pandemic has led to the discrimination against those who have been infected and the marginalized groups, deepening the fractures within society and undermining the human rights and dignity that belong to all people. To prevent the spread of infodemic, the United Nations have launched the Verify Initiative in May last year to combat the spread of inaccurate or malicious information about COVID-19. The UN works with multiple media outlets to disseminate information whose accuracy has been confirmed by its own experts as well as other scientists and specialists. The initiative calls for the participation of information volunteers throughout the world who will actively share reliable content as a means of keeping their families and community safe and connected. Hey, Edwin, is this the vaccination center near your house? Ah? Ayo, you see so many foreign workers lining up. Leh. I heard ah, some people gonna ah, after they receive their vaccinations there. Lah. So you all better don't go lah, if you have your appointments there. Hey man, are you sure about the news? If not, please don't forward to avoid misleading others. The foreign workers you're talking about are human too. The right thing to do for everyone is to get vaccinated as soon as possible and not risking infecting others. As you can see just now, please remember to verify the source of information before forwarding them to stop the infodemic and to prevent rumors to fuel the spread of discrimination and prejudice. Together, let's become wise and reliable information volunteers. Yes, as mentioned earlier, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected almost every sector of society and many are finding themselves more attuned to the pain of those whose lives and dignity are being denied. However, President Ikeda reminds us that we must be careful not to allow our sense of despair to seek an outlet in feelings of disgust towards others. 
Rather, it is vital that we use it to empathize with others, to extend our thoughts to those who are in sufferings and are in difficulties, and from there to direct our energies into expanding solidarity with those engaged in constructive actions to change the harsh realities of society. During the pandemic, we can also see many NGOs taking the initiative to reach out to vulnerable members of the society and help relieve their plight. Let's take a look at the following organizations. The first example is the Food Aid Foundation. Established in 2013, the Food Aid Foundation is Malaysia's first non-profit food bank. Having witnessed large amount of leftover food being wasted on a daily basis, the founder decided to establish the Food Aid Foundation with the intention to rescue food and at the same time provide food assistance to charitable organizations and families in need. Over the past eight years, the foundation has collected over 1 million kilograms of food and extended relief to nearly 3 million beneficiaries. Other than feeding the needies, the initiative also helps to reduce the environmental problems caused by food waste. The second example is the Women's Aid Organization, WAO. WAO is the first organization in Malaysia that offers free shelter to domestic violence survivors. During the movement control order period, WAO continues to provide assistance to women and children to help them escape from the danger of domestic violence. To help survivors get back on their feet, WAO also helps in upskilling women in financial management, knowledge and abilities. By building these basics, they aim to ensure that survivors have the confidence and expertise to lead a new life free from violence and abuse. And finally, Soka Gakai Malaysia SGM. Upholding the spirit of sharing the suffering of others, SGM has recently made charitable donations to the two organizations above to help relieve the plight of the underprivileged. The SGM Selango branch has also offered its culture center as a vaccination center to help boost the vaccination rates in the country. Since the outbreak of the pandemic, SGM has also launched the Hope Field Dialogue campaign to stay connected with our members families and friends, providing mutual care and encouragement, as well as to mutually inspire one another to continuously challenge in their lives and to shine the light of hope upon themselves and others. However deep the chaos and confusion of the times, we must have absolute conviction in the infinite potential inherent in our lives, promote inclusiveness and actively contribute to the community. By doing so, we can transform our circumstances into an arena where we can live out our unique mission, imparting hope and a sense of security to all those around us. Let us all unite and work together to build a post-COVID world that we all envision. Wow! Thank you very much to the three youth for sharing so many inspiring efforts with us. Yes, even in the face of crisis, when we have the strong desire to help others and devote ourselves wholeheartedly to taking action even for the happiness for one single individual, we can create the highest value in our life. You're right. As you, we should be the trailblazer to take the lead in expanding the network of good in our community and to build a post-COVID world where all can live and flourish together in harmonious coexistence. It is the mission of youth to lend a helping hand to those who are struggling. As youth, we must rise with infinite passion and power and take action filled with compassion and wisdom to help those who are in the abyss of suffering. As a dietitian at the National Cancer Society of Malaysia, I strive to provide the best support to patients battling with cancer. SGI President Ikeda once said, The value of the life can only be produced through hard work and missions. 
Youth must have a sense of responsibility and missions, never give up and continue to contribute to society. With the National Immunization Program being implemented, my organization is involved in assisting the house-to-house -house vaccinations program by the Ministry of Health. This program aims to provide vaccinations to those who are severely ill, backbone patients, and people with special needs who are not able to travel to public vaccination centers, ensuring that no one is left behind in the vaccination program. At the same time, I also continue to provide online diet consultations to adult and child cancer patients at my organizations through various platforms. In addition, I'm also involved in COVID-19 management in hospitals. Most COVID-19 patients in the intensive care unit are sedated and ventilated, and they have nutrition, hydration and medications delivered through feeding tubes. As a dietitian, my role is to ensure that nutrition is delivered in the safest and most effective way for each patient. Those patients who are not sedated can also experience malnutrition, changes in eating patterns, loss of sense of taste and smell, and they also have poor appetites before, during and after their COVID-19 infections. At times, I feel physically and mentally exhausted and also feel like giving up on my job. However, seeing the smiles from patients who receive care from us, it gives me the strength to continue persevering and reuniting the passions in my heart. There's nothing more valuable than being able to contribute to the betterment of society. No matter how educated you are, how you treat the people around you ultimately reflects everything. I have recently received a scholarship offer to pursue my PhD studies. I'm determined to deepen my expertise and contribute to society with the knowledge that I have acquired. In 2017, I was honoured to be one of the speakers for the annual Peace Proposal Forum organised by the SGM Student Division. It provided me with the opportunity to learn about President Ikeda's peace ideology. From that day on, I was determined to take concrete actions to actualise the spirit of humanity taught by President Ikeda. Therefore, the other speakers and I decided to visit a refugee centre to listen to their voices and their plight. Before getting in touch with the refugees, I perceived that all the refugees were as portrayed in the negative news I had seen on social media. For example, they were always in a drunken state and involved in criminal activities such as fighting and robbery. However, after interacting with them, I realised that the refugees were in fact very warm and friendly, especially the refugee children. The children were excited when they saw us and welcomed us with bright smiles on their faces. Just like the other children, they are energetic, adorable and have unlimited potential. They hope that they can attend school and get a proper education. After that, we have also invited the refugees to join us for the peace performance to give them hope, courage and strength to continue living. This wonderful experience has enabled me to put aside my prejudice against the refugees and establish genuine friendship with them. I have also developed empathy for those who are suffering. During this pandemic, I have contacted my refugee friends regularly to concern about their situation. Knowing that they are facing work and financial difficulties, I have also done my best to provide them with some basic needs to help support them through this difficult period. President Ikeda once said, It is a proud affirmation of the human spirit to advance together with others in an indefatigable pursuit of shared happiness no matter how painful or desperate that pursuit may at times seem. With the spirit of never leaving behind those struggling in the depths of adversity in mind, I am determined to become a youth who brings hope to those in difficulties and builds a world in which the word misery is no longer used. Thank you Chen Yuan and Crystal for the sharing. When you make the determination to illuminate the corner of the world they inhabit now, it creates a space of security in which people can regain hope and the power to live. 
This space that shines with the spirit of coexistence is the key of realizing a global society in which no one is left behind. Yes, in today's nationwide youth peace assembly, we have discussed the many problems and challenges facing humanity in this time of crisis. However, at the same time, we have also learned that no matter how great the challenges, there is no obstacle that cannot be surmounted if we unite in solidarity. That's right! Just as President Ikeda said, as long as you come together with solidarity, our future will be full of hope. From now on, let's all make a new determination to live a contributive life and create a new age of humanism shining with bright hope. Youth is the hope of humanity. Youth is the light of the world. You arise with the light of hope. I am determined to foster more capable youths for the future, to initiate more dialogues of hope with those who are in need, to be the light of hope to the community and the society, bringing forth absolute happiness to the people around me. I am determined to have a positive mindset and to never leave behind those who are struggling with challenges amid these challenging times. Let's help each other to stay positive and to stay strong during this pandemic season as it is crucial to set us on the right path. I am determined to encourage more people to spread kindness and be courageous to help those who are struggling during the pandemic. Let us lend a helping hand to support them. As a youth, I am determined to contribute to the world, even if a little. I will start by learning about social issues, share them with people around me, and together, we shall take actions to build a better world. As an inhabitant of the earth, I am determined to be a peace lover actively participate in any kind of peace activity that promote world peace. I am determined to reach out to others with a compassionate heart, act of kindness, becoming the pillar to support the society and community to usher in a new era of hope.
no matter how turbulent the world is, I am determined to create value in my life and contribute to the society. I will join hands with my fellow young friends to continue to sow the seeds of peace and happiness throughout the world. I want to become a leader who strives towards achieving the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. I will also learn more about the SDG and engage in conversations to educate others about this topic. Everything starts from one. As a youth, I am determined to engage in more constructive dialogues with friends and sincerely pray for the happiness of those who are suffering.